Waking us up, getting us ready, and motivating us to show up. We ask you to be with those who weren't so fortunate to be able to be here today for whatever reasons. For those who are just restricted from coming, we ask you to lift their spirits, to let them know that you are everywhere we are and they, they can worship you in place. We ask you to be with those that are sick, those that have injuries, those that have spiritual illness, that they know no matter what they can trust in you, that you know what's going on, that you know the outcome, and we pray that you help them and that you help us to accept the outcome that you already know of. We ask you to be with uh, newly baptized, the babes in Christ. Help us to accept them, to welcome them, and we thank you for the new additions. We know just as your angels are rejoicing with you, we get to rejoice here, and we thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. Help us to to be good examples of how we're supposed to be. Even when we fall, we ask you to allow us to be examples of how to get back up, how to trust you to restore us and to get us back on your path. During services today, Lord, we ask you to just lift up our spirits, to help us lift up one another, to help us praise you and glorify you in everything we do, everything we say, everything we see, even when we eat. We ask you to be in our hearts and to give us the courage to be bold enough to speak up and say the reason we do what we do is because of you. Be with us now during our service. Be with us as we remember why we're here, the sacrifices that were made for us to be here, and to never forget what your son is doing for us continually. We thank you for Jesus, for the blood he was willing to shed, for his willingness to leave his glory, to come live amongst us. We just thank you for everything that he continues to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Y'all sound dead. Good morning. morning. Try that one more time. Good morning. morning. This is the part of the service where we make a wonderful and joyful uh, melody in our hearts to God. This is the time we we praise God. Our first hymn selection will be page number 72. page 72 we all know that our Redeemer is not dead and he lives let us sing as as though he does time I know that my Redeemer I know, I know it. 
years I know, I know And my Redeemer lives I know that over yonder Stand a place prepared for me A home, a house not made most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I Next song selection would be 307. 307. I don't know if you prepared, have your backpacks ready, you got your MREs, because we're going to go camping. <laughs> we're going to go camping to Canaan's land. I hope you all prepared to go. We have it. Let us sing. I have left the land of bondage with its earthly treasures. I've journeyed to a place where there is love on every hand. I've exchanged the land of heartaches for a land of promise. I'm camping. I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Oh, every day I'm camping in the camp of Canaan, where with rapture I serve them. It's wondrous beauty, grand. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. I will find the land of promise. I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Out of Egypt I have traveled through the darkest dreary, far over hills and valleys, and across the desert sands. But I've landed safe at home where I shall not grow weary, for I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Oh, oh, every day I'm camping, camping towards the land of Canaan, Canaan, and with rapture I'll serve there its wondrous beauty. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, for I will find the land of promise, for I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Yes, I've reached the land of promise with its scenes of glory, my journey ended in a place so lovely and so grand. I've been led by Jesus to this blessed land of glory. I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Don't you know every day I'm camping, camping towards the land of Canaan. And with raptured our service, one just beauty grant. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, I will find the land of promise for I'm camping. I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land.
Let's pray. Our mighty and awesome Father, we're, we're humbled to be before you, we're humbled to be your sons and daughters. We give you glory. We praise you, dear God. We're so thankful for what we have. We're thankful for the leadership of our congregation, dear God. We thank you so much for our elders and their wives and the wisdom they have. We pray that you give them even more wisdom to help lead us and to, to represent you and to, to encourage us and to help evangelize the valley and the, the world. We pray for the unsettlement in the world, dear God. We pray for wisdom from the leaders to avoid violence. We pray that you give wisdom to, to those who have to make the decisions that are tough, maybe unpopular. We pray that, that the right things are done, that we can glorify you. We pray for our missionaries, especially those who may be in harm's way right now. We pray that you bless them, give them more courage. We thank you so much for what they do, for the sacrifices that they make to be away from their families. We pray for our surrounding area, Alaska, Wasilla Palmer area. We pray that, that you help us to, to be sensitive to what people are, are seeing and to to lead people and to say the right things, to look for opportunities that we can, we can spread the word for you and to be bold in what we say. We pray for our family members who are sick. We pray for our dear brother Frank. We pray that you give him strength and healing, dear Lord. We pray for brother Sperlin. We pray that you give him healing too. We pray that you bless us as we continue our service to you, dear God, and the reading of your word. We pray that you put your arms around our congregation, dear Lord, as we praise you and that we sing to you and we pray that what we do is acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'll be reading from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 19 through the end of the chapter. Proverbs 3, 19 through 35. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open, and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those, from those to whom it is due. When it is in your power, do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do, do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason, for he has done you no harm, when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence, and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Towards the, scor toward the scorners he is scornful, but the humble he gives favor. To the wise... The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Next song selection will be 424. 424. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sinkings, and it is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best. Two. 
Next song selection be 164 before we go into communion. Jesus freely took my place. He bore it all that I might live. Up Calvary's hill in shame, the blessed Savior taught. He bore it all that I might live. They crucified the Son of God. He bore it all that 
he bore it all that I might see his shining face. He bore it all that I might live. If you have your Bibles, turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll be reading verses 23 through 26. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Before we get started, I'd like to thank uh, Gary Lee for filling in for me a few weeks ago. I don't know how it is with you, but a lot of times I start projects at home and I tell my wife, this is a four-hour project, don't worry about it. She kind of rolls her eyes. Sure enough, it was 16 hours, all one weekend. I couldn't make the, the Lord's Supper on Sunday. I had to get some stairs in my house and Gary was... Uh, very kind and gracious to step in and fill in for me. So, and I guess I'm doing that today. I'm filling in for somebody. I don't know who it is, but um, we do that as brothers and sisters. We fill in for each other when we can, and that's one of the great strengths that we have here, right? We have a lot of good men that can just step up and, and stand in and, and proclaim the gospel anytime we need them to. So that, that kind of shows the maturity of this congregation. So thank you to Gary. Um, let's go ahead and get started here. Let me start with reading 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, verses 23 through 26. For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. We have the great privilege and honor today to um, step back and look at our Lord and Savior, to remember him. And I like the words that says, verse 26, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Each one of us is here proclaiming the Lord's death until he come. And, you know, when you really start looking at those words and analyze it, some of the commentators that I've read have talked about uh, this proclamation is like the herald in a, that has a king and he's going out to the world and he's presenting, uh, heralding whatever the king wants him to say, right? And so many people in ancient times, they, they couldn't read. You just couldn't stick it on the door and people could read it. So they have these heralds who, who would go out to the people and, and tell the king or their, their master's wishes. Each one of us is here doing that. We're, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. You know, remarkable verse in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Each one of us has the privilege, as we remember Jesus Christ, to remember him as the light of the world. We know his father is referred to in James as the father of lights. And we know in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that the light of the gospel is the glory of Christ. And each one of us, we're we're presenting and we're proclaiming that good news of Jesus Christ, right? The good news. The good news is that God sent his son to this earth to pay the price that man couldn't pay for himself. That's good news. You know, the idea that um, we're proclaiming something, it's not of us, right? It's not ours. It's, it's from God. We're proclaiming that Jesus is the light. You know, this is a great privilege that we have. And when you think about what is light, I don't know how it is, but in, in my house we have a basement and it's dark a lot of times and the kids are over there flipping on the lights. Even at 30 years old, my kids will leave those lights on, right? Because what is it about? We're drawn to light. We're drawn to light. Uh, you, all of us have been in a dark place and that light comes on and boy, we get over there by the light, right? We're naturally drawn to the light. That's just something that's in us. All of us are drawn to the light, which is Jesus Christ. We have a privilege of each one of us is, is a light, is shining God's light in each one of us. When we get together and we commune, there's this giant light that's, that's coming from the Valley Church. The Valley Church is in a dark place. The world is a dark place. We know there's darkness in the world. There's pain. There's suffering. 
But Jesus is the light, and we're shining our Lord and Savior's light each time we get together, and that's a great privilege that we have. Uh, I've been involved in a men's minister, or prison ministry for, I don't know, many, many, many years. I stopped for a period of eight, nine months, something like that, and the men that have been um, carrying on with that have just done a wonderful work. Well, I had to go again last week, my third Sunday, and it was a privilege for me. I get in there, and this is in the medium side. There's 15, 16 faces. Biggest class. I don't know what they've done while I was gone. When I left, the numbers went up for some reason. <laughs> but there's 15, 16 men, and the place was, I've never seen it that full. And you could tell they were interested in hearing about Jesus Christ. They didn't have to be there, but they were drawn to the light. They're drawn to the message. They're drawn to Jesus Christ, just like we are all drawn to Jesus Christ. So we have the privilege and honor remembering him this morning, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, that's a great privilege. That's a great honor. And that's a great responsibility that we have as, as children of the light that, you know, we're supposed to be walking in the light as his children. And this is what we should be doing uh, today and not only in our congregation but uh, brothers and sisters all over the world are remembering him and proclaiming him as uh, Jesus Christ that went to the cross and died for the sins that man could not pay for himself so keep these things in mind as we go to our father in prayer Would you ask me Lord and Father we are so thankful for all the many blessings of this life we're thankful Father for you being the great and the powerful God that you are Father, we give you honor and glory in all things, understanding, Father, how great and how powerful you are. Father, it's a great privilege for us uh, today to be gathered here to proclaim uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to remember him, to remember his uh, virgin birth, his life, and his death on that cross. But, Father, we know the story does not end on the cross. We know, Father, that he went in the grave for three days and he rose as the first fruit of all those that are going to rise again. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for you loving mankind so much that you offered your son on that cross. Father, let us keep these things in mind as we partake of this bread, which is symbolic of our Lord and Savior's body. We know, Father, he was a real man that had a real body that had to suffer for our sins and go to that cross and then raise again. Father, bless us in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray and give our thanks. Amen.
before we take the fruit of the vine, verse 25 says, in this, in this way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, this new covenant was paid for in blood. That's why we have the fruit of the vine. That's sim symbolism for the blood. But it also underscores the idea of a New Testament. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 9 that unless the testor is dead, his testament does not become into effect. We know our Lord and Savior went to that cross. Now the Old Testament has been, done away, been fulfilled, and the New Testament that we have is our new covenant, paid for by blood. Would you bow with me, Ken? Lord and Father, we're so thankful for, again to uh, gather around this table and partake of this fruit of the vine, which is symbolic of our Lord and Savior's blood and the new covenant of the New Testament. Father, we are th so thankful for, for you and you loving mankind so much that you offered your only begotten Son. Father, we pray that through this remembrance it will spark each one of us to a greater obedience, a greater service, and a greater faithfulness in your kingdom. Help us, Father, to understand uh, uh, your mysteries and help, Father, uh, through this uh, remembrance to um, to help us in our faith, to help us be bold as we uh, preach and teach wherever we're at. Father, bless us and forgive us our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray and give our thanks. Amen.
That completes the Lord's Supper. Now as a matter of convenience, we'll take time to lay by in store. Today we have a, a great privilege. We're going to have um, two offerings, two, two giving opportunities to give today. One is our normal giving that we do every Sunday, but we're also taking this time to have a special contribution for a family in need. There again, that's part of what we do to help one another, to support one another. When brothers and sisters need help, we step up and we try to do what we can. Uh, to, to ease their their time and uh, of, of suffering and pain in any way we can. So uh, there'll be two offerings. This first one is just our normal offering. And then before the second offering, Robert will get up and speak a little bit. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me over to uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. Now this I say, he who spo- sows sparingly will also rip- reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, I say we had two opportunities today to give. That's a great privilege that we have, right? As children of the light, we want to support one another. We want to support the activities that we have here. I was just mentioning we went, um, you know, I went up to the prison ministry. That prison ministry has been going on with a lot of good men for a lot of years. It takes funds to do that. So this idea of spreading the good news, that's why we give. We want to sh- We want to spread the light as much as we can. So we, it's a great privilege that we have. And I like the way these verses, and that's why I always read these verses, that God loves a cheerful giver. Should we give back to God stingingly? Look what he gave already for us through offering his son. So this is a great privilege. It's a great opportunity that we have to give back to the Lord. Would you bow with me, please? Lord and Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings of this life. Father, we give you honor and glory in all things, understanding that all good things come from you, the giver of all good and perfect gifts, the Father of lights. Father, we are so thankful for the privileges that we have. We are so thankful, Father, for the privilege of knowing your son and being uh, uh, part of your uh, family and being heirs to the promise. Father, we are thankful for the good things in this life, for our jobs, our families. Um, the monetary things that we have, but Father, we also understand that all good things come from you and everything that we have is yours. Father, help us today as we give back a portion of what you've already given to us and help us do so cheerfully and willingly to, so we can support the work here. Father, bless us in all that we do and forgive us when we sin. As children often do, Father, we sin and fall short. But Father, give us the, the right, help us have the right attitude and the right heart to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray and give our thanks. Amen. morning. On the 10th of February, Steve uh, Sperland and his son-in-law, Michael Roseberry, were driving between jobs in the Palmer area and a a woman ran a stop sign, didn't even slow down. 
apparently the, uh, just by the traffic uh, accident, the, uh, she probably never saw the sign. Um, it was a T-bone accident. Uh, everybody was able to recover or has been recovering from the accident, but we're all with some injuries. And Steve, it took him a week later for an MRI to show that he has cracked vertebrae uh, and three damaged discs, one of them ruptured. He continued for another week to do light work and light things as he could before a doctor reviewing his MRI told him he shouldn't be moving. He shouldn't be moving at all with the vertebrae cracked like it is. And he's going to need three months of being, immobile is not the right word, but protecting the movement of his back. So he has a brace, two different types of braces that he wears at different times. Uh, Steve's job is his own company, and Michael is his employee. And now both of them are in, 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 in loss over him unable to work. He has jobs. Uh, he's able to support Michael doing a few things, but uh, he's fighting for the, rec for the recovery of his company and of his family. All of his, uh, his home uh, support comes through that one company, and it is now in jeopardy. So we've decided to have a special uh, today, but this is, he's going to have three months without work. Um, and we're going to keep tabs with him to see how it's going and what else he needs. He does have a tractor that he, is, he needs to sell to help keep himself afloat. So if anybody knows somebody who could use one, you have to talk to Steve about the details. But uh, um, that's another way we could help him out in things like that. So let's go to our Father in prayer. This is the time for us to step up and help out a church family that has sacrificed and given and served for decades. Uh, as uh, wherever they have lived. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, uh, we pray that we can uh, appropriately step up and take care and serve the Spurlins families. We thank you for their uh, sweet heart and their deep work and their quiet, caring ways and pray that uh, in this difficulty and in this uh, uh, accident that Steve uh, and the Roseberries are able to recover uh, from this, that they can recover physically, uh, they can recover financially, uh, and that business-wise, that he can uh, keep his business going. Father, we pray that we can uh, serve them in, in lots of different ways. Please help, help us encourage them, uh, serve them, do for them in any way we can, and at this moment, uh, be financially uh, supportive of, of where they are. We pray this is all to your glory, Father, uh, none to us, and we pray that Steve heals quickly and, and strongly. Uh, from his injuries. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can please mark your song books at 576 uh, for the song of invitation. It's 576 for the song of invitation. And we'll be singing one verse of 512. It's 512 before we have scripture reading. If we can all please stand for this song.
Good morning. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, No, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, You go, he said. Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two sons obeyed his father? They replied, The first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth. Corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did, and even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Good morning, family. Good to have you all with us today. If you're visiting with us, I see uh, some new faces. I see some faces maybe we haven't seen from a while from different congregations visiting us. Thank you, sir. Uh, if you're here today, we're glad to have you, and uh, I think um, I think you found a good family. I think you've stumbled upon uh, a good group of people, and so we're thankful to have you here and. It's our desire that uh, time that you spend with us is, is time with Christ. We're glad to have you here today. <clears throat> we'll be in Matthew 21. I want to put a question out that I want you to think about, and we'll come back to it here in a minute or two. Uh, and that question is, have you ever given a gift that didn't cost you anything? Have you ever given a gift... They didn't cost you anything. Think about that. Uh, some of you I know have, because I've been to your white elephant parties, <laughs> and I've given you gifts that didn't cost me anything, and you've returned the favor. So there's, there's that. You have to come up with your own, because I already used that one. Gift that didn't cost you anything. We'll get to that here in a few minutes. We're going to pick up in our study of the book of Matthew in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 is very likely a Tuesday. Now we've, we've jumped, we've been in the first part of the book and we studied some in Matthew 13 and now we're jumping to Matthew 21 which is very likely the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus talks about repentance and he talks about entering the kingdom. We talked about last week the kingdom of heaven and, and in our life today in the kingdom looking forward to glimpses of heaven. Today we're going to talk about repentance and entering the kingdom of heaven. The reason I've jumped ahead to Matthew 21 is because it echoes or it is, is getting toward the completion of things that both John and Jesus said in Matthew 3 and Matthew 4. Do you remember John the Baptist opening statement when he first stepped out into the desert in his camel skin? <clears throat> his message was in Matthew 3 verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 21 talks about repentance. You know what Jesus' first preaching message was when he stepped onto the scene? Matthew 4 17, you know what he said? He said the same thing as John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus echoes John. Entering kingdom life, entering the kingdom of heaven, has something to do with repentance. Have you given a gift that didn't cost you anything? you come up with anything yet? Keep thinking on that. Jesus' parable considers repentance. He tells this parable in Matthew 21 of two sons. And he asks his audience basically, you know, which one obeys God? But then 
Implicitly, he's saying, which son do you bear a resemblance to? Which son do you resemble in your life and in your way of thinking? What does it mean to bear a resemblance? This is a personal picture. This is uh, illustrating the resemblance between a father and son. This is my father and my brother. And one thing the Shipley boys are proud of is we like cookies like our daddy does. And, uh, you know, here they are, caught in the act. Talk about hand in the cookie jar. Uh, they look alike, and they both share a resemblance. You could say, yep, that is that man's son. They bear a resemblance. <laughs> this next picture here, if you can see the girl's face down in, uh, in the, the lower middle uh, toward the left side, uh, this is Bernice King, and she bears a resemblance to her father. <laughs> Holding Bernice King is Corita Scott King, who doesn't bear a physical resemblance to her husband, but in terms of ideas that she stands for, she very much resembles her husband. You see, Bernice and Corita Scott are sitting in some kind of church building at the funeral of Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King. The interesting thing about this is there were a ton of people at this funeral. But you know what? The man, uh, the person who killed Martin Luther King, uh, wasn't caught at the time. And so a bunch of people who stood for what Dr. King stood for are coming to this public place to honor him, and the man who killed him is still on the loose. What's more is the National Guard that was called in to make sure that nothing bad happened to these people they were, they, were, they were all white National Guards uh, men at the time, and they were the organ, not the organization, but they were the group that Martin Luther King often found himself opposed to. When he and his followers would go and do a peaceful march, guess what? They'd send the, the National Guard in to make sure uh, things didn't get rowdy. And so here's this, da- uh, here's this group of people trying to mourn in danger from this man who... Pretend, who, who shot Dr. Martin Luther King and the people who were guarding them they didn't know if they were going to stand and guard and yet for a moment whether their skin was white or black whether they were related to Dr. King or not they all resembled this man's ideas of peaceful uh, of a peaceful resistance to equal treatment and so we know that there's a physical resemblance amongst people but what Jesus is talking about here is Not just do you look like this son or this father, but do you resemble these sons or one of these sons in terms of behavior and ideology? Jesus is asking the audience these questions. Which son did Jesus' audience resemble? Now we'll come back to that question of, of have you ever given something that didn't cost? Which son... We're going to read through Jesus' explanation here. Which son gives something that costs? Let's think about that as we go through here. The first son, Matthew 21, verse 28. Jesus says, what do you think? A man had two sons. And to the first son, he says, go and work in the vineyard today. And what does the first son say? He says, I will not. Deuteronomy chapter 21 adds a layer to this defiance of parenthood uh, that really ups the ante here. Go over to Deuteronomy 21. So the son who ends up doing the father's will starts off by disobeying his father. And, and this isn't to be taken lightly. In fact, uh, the, the, the audience would have likely had a gasp moment. Jesus would have said, there's a father. And he said, son, go work in the vineyard. And the son said, no. And the people in the crowd would have said, oh, what? You don't say no to your parents. Deuteronomy 21, if a man, 21 verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, he will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take Hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. 
Now, obviously, this father doesn't do this, but he could have. Let's finish this passage here in Deuteronomy 21, verse 20. And they shall say to the elders of this city, uh, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton. He's a drunkard, whatever his offense is. Verse 21. Then all the men of the city shall slap him on the wrist and say, do no more. Is that, you think what it says? Is that how the Old Testament works? All the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. That message wasn't like, hey, yeah, this is great. Go out and stone your children. It was for the purpose of fear and respect. And so the first son who ends up getting it right actually really blew it. This was scandalous. <clears throat> so Jesus goes on and he says at the end of verse 31, explaining about the first son, Truly I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of heaven before you. The corrupt tax collectors and the prostitutes of the day were this first son who by their immoral choices of life told John the Baptist and told Jesus, I will not work in that vineyard. I'm going to go do my own thing. But then who were the first ones to accept the message of John and the message of Jesus? For John came to you, uh, verse, verse 32, John came to you in the ray of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. The people who you think have no business being in the kingdom of heaven, who rejected God by their immoral way of life, when John said, change your way of thinking, they did. And they went in the vineyard and they worked for the Father. The ASV, the American Standard Version, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version says that the son changed his mind. And the ASV says he repented. And so if you want to know what repentance means, it's first of all to change your mind. The son said, no, I am not going to go out there. And he walked out of the house stubborn and angry. And then he changed his mind, and then he went and he acted. You see the connection there between believing the message of John? It's implicitly tied to repenting and obedience. Did you catch what Jesus said there? The tax collectors and the prostitutes believed John, and guess what belief meant? It meant you repented and you obeyed. Those individuals resembled the first son, did they not? <clears throat> the second son is asked the same thing. Father says, go work in the vineyard, and what does the second son say? The second son talks a good game, doesn't he? He says, I will go. And then he adds, sir. All right, so he's respectful as well. But he did not go. And after he didn't go, he never repents and changes his mind and ends up going. And so those who talk about obedience to God and who talk about wanting to please God, but then reject the message of John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Reject the message of Jesus, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Where do they end up? The religious leaders of their day rejected John, rejected Jesus, and they rejected the kingdom of of heaven. They didn't believe what John had to say, and they lacked obedience and repentance. But you see, both sons resembled each other. I'm sure they looked like their father in this parable. It was a parable, and weren't real sons, but I'm sure they looked like each other. But they also resembled each other in that they were first disobedient. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the religious leaders, everybody had been disobedient to God. This is why the gospel, which means good news, is first bad news. The gospel comes to each one of us and says, you have said no to God. You have rejected God. You have been disobedient to God. Every one of us has fallen underneath that. Both sons were accountable. It was bad news before it was good news. So how about that gift that didn't cost you anything? Who gave the gift that didn't cost anything? 
The religious leaders had a lot to give, and they gave a gift that didn't really cost that much. But the first son, in repentance, I mean, imagine the cost. You know, you, you have an argument with your father, and you storm out. The last thing you want to do is go back in and say, yeah, I was wrong. Maybe you want to go work, but you don't want him to look over and see you and have the satisfaction that he was right. The first son gave up everything. He gave up his pride. He gave up the knowledge that he was right. And he went and did the father's will. I want to look at another example of repentance. <clears throat> Let's go over to 1 Chronicles 21. It's a ways back in your, in your Bibles there, uh, but I think it'll be worth for us to go. I think, you know, it's convenient, Matthew 21, 1 Chronicles 21, nice little coincidence there. 1 Chronicles 21, I was drawn to this story because Matthew is presenting to us the son of David, right? The kingly son. And usually it's supposed to be the father, right, who gets it right, and the son who has the disobedience. But in this case, we see the son, we see Jesus getting it right. And we're going to read a story about how David himself needed to repent. David, often known as a, a man after God's own heart. But if you read about David's life, you have to answer for yourself, how is he a man after God's own heart? What story about the life of David convicts you that he truly was a man after God's own heart? Because I tell you what, David did some pretty awful things. And it wasn't just one big mess up that he had. He had several things where he tripped over himself. And I, I think you've got to come up with, a, with something in your mind about what defines him as a man after God's own heart. Now, I've got one. I'd like to share that with you here. Uh, 1 Chronicles 21. You may have your own, but let's look here at 1 Chronicles 21. Uh, verse 1. David, in his pride, asks for a census of Israel. This is the height of his power. And he goes and he says, I want to count all of the people just so I can know how awesome that I am. And Joab says, they're all your people anyway. Why do you have to count them? Verse 1. Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. There's a lot more to this story, but eventually, verse 7, G, uh, uh, David figures out he gets it wrong. <clears throat> and he's, he's sorry. He has guilt. Verse 7, God was displeased with this thing, and he struck all of Israel. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. But now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. Now this is a lesson about repentance, and David hasn't gotten to repentance yet. He's just felt guilty. Man, I'm sorry that worked out that way, and I'm sorry I got caught doing this. But he hasn't gotten to his repentance yet. Verse 13, this is, a, this is an incredible verse here. We talk a lot about the Old Testament, you know, being a, a, an Old Testament of wrath. But notice what David says here, verse 13. David said to Gad, the prophet, I am in great distress. Guilt brings us into great distress, doesn't it? But he's not content to wallow in his guilt. He says, let me fall into the hand of the Lord for what is there? For his mercy is very great. This is part of God, David being a man after God's own heart. His mercy is very great. Don't let me fall into the hands of men. You know, as men, when we do something wrong, you try and, maybe you try and cover it up. I know I try and do that. Maybe you try and lie about it. Maybe you try and minimize it. Maybe... Maybe you try and do a bunch of good things, right? To sort of hide the fact that you did this bad thing. And when we fall into the hands of man, that all works out very poorly for us. But David seeks the Lord's mercy. You see, repentance is more than an apology. Now, apologizing is good. I, we teach our children that apologizing is good. But you know, in the steps to salvation in the New Testament, the word apology, in terms of I'm sorry, doesn't show up. It's not enough just to say, well, I got caught. I'm sorry, God. It involves falling into the hands of the Lord's mercy. What does that mean? 
It means taking responsibility for your sin. Say, see that mess that I made that, that hurt people? I'm not just sorry, but I take responsibility that I did this thing that caused myself pain and caused others pain. And so it, it, it leads David in his repentance to give a gift that costs him something. He has this other great phrase that he uses here. He goes on and he, he comes into this uh, vineyard. And again, there's some weird things that happen here, but I want to boil this down. He runs into a man named Ornan, O-R-N-A-N. And Ornan, the, the king comes to Ornan, and Ornan owns this field, and he wants to make repentance easier for David. And he's like, here, take one of my livestock, and I want you to sacrifice it. Now, is David giving a sacrifice just to appease God, to pay God back? I mean, think about that. Lots of people died because of this sin, and you're telling me one animal is going to repay God for all of this bad stuff that has happened? David's not trying to buy God back. The sacrificial system was intended to show them when you sin, something dies. I mean, the wages of sin is death, and you ultimately die, but it was a visual representation of the spiritual reality that they found themselves in. And so this guy says, hey, I'll help you out, King David, since you're a great king. I'm going to give you this, this livestock for free. And David puts his foot down in, in verse 24. He says, no, I will buy them for full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, and I will not offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David says, I'm not going to give something that doesn't cost me anything. He knows in his mind that even this good gift that he is trying to give back is tainted by sin. His life now smells of sin. It smells of death. The, the prophet in Isaiah 64 puts it very eloquently. He says, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Take an honest look at David's life and step back and convince me that he always got it right. Adultery, murder, pride. You know, if those were the first three things on his resume, would you send your kid there to take advice from him? His whole life is tainted by this sin. And yet, because he understands that, and he owns that, and he says, those are the things I have done, and I am responsible for this pain, and what I give back to God will not be something that costs me nothing. He can't simply bury his sin with a mountain of his own sacrifice. God's mercy to him is bad news before it is good news. And even for David, only the blood of Jesus allows any of his righteousness to be something of good. First Chronicles 22 verse 11. David then repents and he goes into the he goes into the vineyard of his life, right? What does it mean to go into the vineyard? The son goes into the vineyard. Well, part of David's vineyard was to raise a righteous son named Solomon. Notice this great advice that he gives, 21 verse 11. Now my son, the Lord be with you so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding. Isn't that great advice from a father to a son? Oh, but if Solomon knew all the things that his father had done wrong, how could that be good and godly advice? But for the blood of Jesus, the best of our good deeds are still tainted by our sin. You know, the, the Nazi soldier who denied kindness to the Jew, you didn't see those soldiers throwing their own families into the prison camps, did you? I mean, provided they were all good Nazis, right? I mean, even, even the Nazi understood kindness on some level. We understand the, the, the attributes and the kindness of God on some level and we try and be merciful to each other and we try and do good things 
But our good things will never add up to the goodness and the greatness of God. Our morals never attain to God's. And so why should we listen to David? Because David, like Abraham, had his good deeds reckoned to him as righteousness. He took responsibility for his sins and he gave it to God and he says, you know, I've got all this sin in my life and I try and do good things but I'm going to give it to you. And you know what God does when we, when we repent and we change our way of thinking and we start doing good things for him? He takes our feeble attempt and he washes it in the blood of Jesus and he gives it back to us on his level of righteousness. But it's all him. Romans 4, verse 3. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. If you read the story of Abraham, Abraham didn't always believe or get it right either. And so how does his feeble attempt at belief attain to the righteousness of God? It's because God takes it, and in the blood of Jesus, he considers it, he reckons it, he counts it as righteousness. Which son does the Christian resemble? Here's what I've tried to say today. Repentance is not a profound feeling of guilt. Guilt rejects grace. It says, I'm sorry, I feel bad, and then it just sits and wallows in guilt. That's not repentance. Repentance is not burying our sins in a mountain of good deeds. Now, we ought to strive to live the life of the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to be great in the kingdom, live the life of the Sermon on the Mount. But the morals of the Sermon on the Mount are nothing without the death on the hill. Of Jesus Christ. Repentance is not burying our, our sins in a mountain of good works. Repentance is reading through the gospel and reading through what happens to Jesus and say, I played a part in that. I take responsibility. I accept responsibility. And I accept that I need God to mercifully bury my sins in Jesus in baptism's waters. And so which son does the Christian resemble? Because we go out into the field and we think, you know, I'm like that first son who told God no, but then I said okay, and, and here we are, the Valley Church, and we're trying to strive in the vineyard, but in the back of our mind we know God must be sitting back there looking at me, remembering that I said no to his face. But I don't think that's the way God sees us at all. I think we go out into the field and God looks out on us, and because of the blood of Jesus, which son do we resemble? We resemble that third son who told the story. He looks out at us and he sees Jesus working and saying yes. Read with me this poem. We are the son who said to father, we will not. Walking away in anger to freedom, or so we thought. We changed our mind, it cost us our pride. We work, humbled and willing, in God's kingdom as we ought. What does the Father see of us now? I am the Father to whom you say, I will not. With patient love I watch you go, distraught. You change your mind, costing you everything, every time. By your brother's blood, this now is my constant thought. I hear you say, I will, and then you go and do. Because I see most your resemblance to the one who gave his life for you. I'll leave you with these two thoughts here. Repentance doesn't leave us wondering, can I ever be good enough? If you're not a Christian today, don't wallow in, I'm never going to be good enough for this. Repentance asks, accept Christ. And as we see ourselves as evangelists, See yourself as God sees you. He knows you're going to go out and that we're going to fail at times. But he's not waiting for us to be good enough. He's waiting for us to accept Christ. And he's waiting for us to look at other people who we may honestly look at and say, I don't think they're ever going to be good enough for this life. But that's not what we ask of them. We say, will you accept Christ? Is there a chance you'll look at the life of Jesus? That's our message. That's the message of the two sons that we would all grow up and resemble Christ by the blood of Christ. I thank you for your time, for your attention.
May God bless us all as we try and live our life. If you need to repent and begin your life uh, following our Lord and Savior, then you can make that known now. Jason's got a song ready for us. Let's all stand and sing. There's a The elders want uh, your advice or help or what can we do to make this better. At the end of our services, right after our closing prayer, a lot of folks get up to go to take care of some, a couple of them to take care of some important things, food preparation or other things going on. And it ends up being a cascade effect of more and more and more. And we would like to give the, the, the announcements uh, proper respect. So we either need to move the announcements to another part of what, how we do this or we need to find a way to, to take care of what we need to without so much movement and noise to not be disrespectful to others and to the announcements themselves. So we're not sure how to best handle that. Uh, we have some things that need taken care of. So if you'd let us know how do we make the end of our service go more smoothly, we, we, could, we could use the, the help and the uh, advice. Uh, right now, I've got some young men ready. Guys, go ahead. Pass out some, some uh, papers for you. It's one per a, a adult. I don't want to disrespect the teenagers. They got work to do too. Uh, we'll just try to make it one for adult to start with. And it's for the lectureship. Uh, we had an excellent meeting yesterday. I don't know, about 30 people came together and, and we covered all the subjects. But we found out some things we still need uh, taken care of. Everything from housing visitors uh, for that weekend to freezer space. I hadn't thought about that. Some of the pre-prepared pre food needs to be stored in a freezer. Do you have freezer space? And then the more obvious things of classroom teachers uh, and uh, folks to help with the nursery and the setup and takedown and that kind of thing. So, um, so this is a for everybody. We'd li like everybody to put their name on one sheet and then consider your situation. If you're, gonna, if you're working on the slope and you're gone that weekend, just write, I'll be praying. I'll pray for the, for the weekend. And that's great. That's awesome service. So there's nothing weak about prayer, and there's nothing weak about, about not being able to do a physical thing that weekend, uh, depending on your situation. But, but we need everybody, all hands on deck for this. Uh, if you uh, volunteer to teach, 
I hope it'll, it should be just for a single class, so you can attend all the other lessons. If you volunteer to help and serve, it should be just for a period of time, so you can attend all the other parts of the lectureship. And if we spread the work around, uh, it will be that. And so I'd like everybody, all the adults, everybody to fill out one and to say what it is that you can do uh, on that sheet and help us out. Turn them in at the back when you're leaving and it'll be a great help. We're, it looks like things are going very well. We just have to uh, fill in all the, the detail spots now of what we need. Thank you all so much. While we're closing for our Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time and that we're here to worship and to study your word and to to grow and to encourage one another and to be able to go out and to spread your word and have that strength. We ask you to be with Frank and to be with the other ones that are on our list and be with Nate as he put on Christ and a new brother and watch over our ones that are homebound that we always encourage them and let them know that they are still part of the congregation and and to, to go visit them and, and encourage them that way and, and send cards. I ask you to be with our elders and our deacons. I ask you to be with our upcoming lectureship, that the planning of that and that that is a success, that we get to meet other brothers and sisters around the state and to be know that we always have a, a family with you no matter where we go at. I ask you to be with our new building and that keeps moving forward and that one day we'll be able to, to be in it and to use that tool to spread your word even more. I ask you to be with other aimers again that are out in the field and to be with Lauren Penny and the situation they're in where they're at and you keep them safe and to keep them encouraged and Lauren as he's teaching the lessons he has to encourage us throughout this week and to help us always remember that we have you and that we can always talk to you in prayer and to encourage ourselves and to strengthen us when things get tough I ask you to be with us when we're at work that we set the right example and no matter where we're at I ask you again to always remember us in our prayer in Jesus name Amen. Good morning, everyone. Have a lot of announcements today, so please pay attention. If you're visiting with us, we're very glad that you're here. We hope that you'll stay and join us for lunch. Please fill out a visitor information card so we have a record of your attendance. And then when I'm done speaking, we'll serve up downstairs and eat in the, in the fellowship hall, and everyone's welcome to join us, whether you brought something or not, and Bible classes will follow. So everyone, please take a look at the bulletin. There's several things on here, but there's several new announcements, particularly for those needing prayers. Um, Jessica Gibson is recovering from a car accident, has some injury, whiplash injury, so please continue to pray for her. And, of course, pray for Steve Sperlin and his son-in-law, Michael Rosebury, as we uh, prayed for earlier today. Um, there's several others on the list. Martha Lewis is recovering from a fall. From a fall. Uh, Frank and Diane Renee continue to recover. Uh, from health issues and, and Millerod. So please um, keep all these people in mind. Also, please continue to pray for Thailand and the Ukraine and Syria and Nigeria. There's a lot of violence going on around the world. Let's not forget to pray for the people suffering in that, those uh, humanitarian situations. Um, Julie Kern's sister, Lois Strait, um, has been diagnosed with pneumonia and she also has COPD and she's in ICU right now, so prayers are requested. For Lois, please keep her and her family in your prayers. Uh, Bob Garrett's uncle, Walter Garrett Jr., who lives in Washington, um, he has been diagnosed with a very fast-moving uh, cancer, and uh, that's very disparate situation.